Welcome back to the Stiefelser course on Generative Adversarial Networks. I'm Mandy, and in this episode, we'll be examining the computational graphs that are used to compute gradients via backpropagation during neural network training. Computational graphs are a fundamental piece of neural network training in general, but there's a key reason to go over them now in this GAN course. Recall that this is the training loop that we use to train DC GAN with PyTorch. During the discriminator portion of training, we generated a batch of random noise vectors and passed that batch to the generator to create a batch of fake images. We then pass these fake images to the discriminator to obtain a prediction. And when we did this step, we called detach on the fake images tensor. We briefly discussed how by calling detach on this tensor, we were detaching the computational graph. And so in order to actually understand what we're even doing here, we need to first be able to understand what computational graphs are and how they're used. So that's the direction that we'll be going in now. We'll be gaining an understanding of computational graphs, and we'll be showing some examples of inspecting computational graphs using the PyTorch API. And although we'll be using PyTorch for demo purposes, computational graphs are a fundamental piece of neural network training in general, so it's not anything specific to PyTorch at all. All right, so in our demo, we'll be using the GraphViz and TorchViz libraries to plot some illustrations of computational graphs. So if you don't have these libraries installed already, then you need to run these commands from your console to get them installed before we can import them and make use of them here. All right, and after we have these libraries installed, the first thing we're going to do is import PyTorch along with the modules that we'll be making use of and the GraphViz and TorchViz libraries. Next, we'll create two tensors, A and B, which each just contain one float value. We're specifying requires grad equals true for each of these tensors, which means that we will want to track the history of operations that occur on these two tensors. The recorded operations that occur on a tensor is what's referred to as its computational graph. And we can think of a computational graph as being attached to a tensor. Generally, we set this requires grad equals true on a tensor when we know that later we'll want to compute the derivative of something with respect to this tensor. For example, think about the weights of a neural network. Each of the weights in a neural network are initialized with this requires grad equals true parameter set because later we'll want to compute the derivative of the loss with respect to each of the weights in the network. When a tensor has requires grad equals true, we'll generally say that the tensor has gradient tracking turned on or enabled. And just another piece about lingo or vocabulary, whenever we have these user created tensors like what's shown here with the requires grad parameter set to true, these types of tensors are called leaf tensors or leaf nodes. For a given graph, a leaf tensor is a tensor in the graph that was not created as a result of any of the other operations in the graph. This idea should make more sense along with why we call these tensors leaf tensors in a few moments whenever we plot some visualizations of computational graphs. All right, so we'll go ahead and actually create these two tensors now. And now we'll create a third tensor called C, which is the sum of tensors A and B. By printing C, we can see the value of C is three, which is a result of the sum of one and two. And we can also see this grad function, which is add backward. When a tensor is created as a result of one or more tensors that have gradient tracking enabled, it will have this grad function that discloses how this tensor was created. In the case of C, we can tell that C was created as a result of the addition operation. And specifically, add backward is the name of the function that will be called when backpropagation occurs on this tensor. Again, this will make a lot more sense when we have a visualization, but first we have to get through the creations of our tensors before we can see that visualization. Now we'll create another tensor, D, which is the product of tensor C and tensor A. So by printing D, we can see the value contained in the tensor is 3 as a result of 3 times 1. And we can see the grad function of D is mole backward. 
So this lets us know that D was created as a result of multiplication. And because D has a grad function in general, we're able to infer that D was created as a result of some operation that occurred on a tensor that has gradient tracking enabled. Because we just created D, uh, we know that already. And in general, if a tensor has a grad function, then that means that we're able to understand how this tensor would change if the leaf tensors that led to this tensor's creation changed. In other words, we can compute the tensor's gradient with respect to the leaf tensors that led to its creation. So for example, with tensor D, we can compute the derivative of D with respect to leaf tensor A, and because C is a result of the sum of tensor A and B, which are each leaf tensors, then we can also compute the derivative of D with respect to B. This is analogous to the idea of computing the derivative of the loss with respect to weights in a neural network. The weights in a neural network are considered leaf tensors because they're not created as a result of any operation from a given computational graph, and they have gradient tracking enabled. And because the loss is a function of these weights, of these leaf tensors, then the loss will have a grad function. And that grad function discloses how the loss was derived and also how backpropagation can occur to calculate the gradients of the loss with respect to all of the weights, all of these leaf tensors. So now let's come back to our example here. So if we wanted to calculate the derivative of D with respect to the leaf tensors A and B, then we first have to call backward on tensor D. Calling backward computes the gradients of tensor D with respect to all the leaf tensors that led to its creation. So all of the leaf tensors that are in D's computational graph. The resulting gradients will be accessible by calling grad on each of the leaf tensors. So we call backward on tensor D, which is going to compute the gradients of D with respect to each of the leaf tensors A and B, and then to access the gradient with respect to A, we call A.grad, and then to access D's gradient with respect to B, we call B.grad. So we're going to print out A.grad and B.grad before we call backward, and then we're going to call backward on D, and then we're going to print out A and B's gradients again to see how it changed before and after we called backward on D. All right, so we'll do that now. All right, so here we can see that for A and B's gradients, we both had none before the backward pass. And then after the backward pass, we calculated the gradients of D with respect to both A and B. And then we can see now that the gradient of D with respect to A is four, and with respect to B is one. And this is exactly what happens when we call backward on the loss function of a neural network we are then able to get all of the gradients associated with each of the weights, which are leaf tensors, in the network. We can then, of course, take those gradients and update the weights with them. So now we'll scroll up a bit, and in this cell, we'll be making use of the TorchViz library to plot D's computational graph. So if we run this cell and scroll down a bit, we have D's computational graph. So here is our resulting tensor D, and these blue tensors here are our original leaf tensors A and B. So we can see why it makes sense to call these leaves as they are occurring kind of at the end of what you would call these branches here. So we can see how this gives us a visual representation of the computational graph that the backward function would use to compute the gradients on D with respect to the leaf tensors. All right, so we know that tensor D has a grad function because it was derived from leaf tensors that have gradient tracking enabled. But by calling next functions on D's grad function, we can see the previous operations that ultimately led to D's creation rather than just the operation immediately resulting in D. Here we can see First, D's grad function is mole backward, which is shown here in the graph. And we can see that mole backward was a result of 
add backward and an accumulated gradient object. So mole backward is a result of add backward and the accumulated gradient object A here in this case. And we can go one step further here by printing out the grad functions that occurred before what led to this mole backward. So let's print this. So by accessing these grad functions and the next functions, that is how we're able to get this visual representation. That's how the TorchViz library is printing these values in this nicely illustrated form. It's by accessing the grad functions as we just did. And actually, we have this function here that we've created called walk graph that goes through the functions that we just stepped through ourselves manually. But instead, it's going to go through the functions in this loop and then print them in such a way that it looks like we can walk through the graph how we did with the visual TorchViz illustration. So we'll go ahead and create this function now, and then we'll call this function and pass D's grad function to it, and it should give us a representation of D's graph. So we can see that the printout from this function gives us just another representation of D's computational graph that's directly comparable to the illustration that we looked at using TorchViz. So now we should have a pretty solid understanding of computational graphs and how they're used to compute gradients during neural network training. We're now going to circle back to talking about the detach function for which we talked about at the beginning of this episode that we used during the training loop of our DCGAN implementation in PyTorch. So to illustrate detach in action, we're first going to create three new PyTorch tensors that each just hold one single float value apiece. And each of these tensors have gradient tracking enabled, so we'll be able to compute the derivative of some later tensors that are derived as a result of these leaf tensors. So we will create tensors A, B, and C. And next we have tensor D, which is the sum of leaf tensor A and leaf tensor B. So now we'll create two final tensors. The first tensor, tensor E, will be the result of the ReLU operation on tensor D detached from its current graph plus tensor C. So it will be the result of ReLU of tensor D and tensor C. Tensor F is going to be the exact same value. However, we are not detaching D's graph whenever we create F. All right, so we have tensor E and tensor F are both the same in terms of the value that it will hold. However, E and F's computational graph, as we'll see, will differ from each other because we are detaching D's graph whenever we create E and we're not detaching it when we create F. All right, so we'll create these two tensors and now we are going to use TorchViz to plot both tensor E and tensor F's computational graphs and compare the two. So here's E's graph. We can see that E is a result of the addition operation that occurred between leaf tensor C and something else that we don't know about. Now we know because we just created E that E is the result of the sum of C with the ReLU operation on D. But we detach D's graph, so it is not showing up in E's graph. Now we'll look at F's computational graph, which recall did not have D's graph detached whenever we created F. So we'll just scroll down here and print F's graph. All right, so here is F's graph. So just at a quick overview, we can tell that it's much more comprehensive looking than E's. So here, just like we saw with tensor E, F is a result of the addition operation with the leaf tensor C and something else. But this something else is disclosed to us because this something else is D, and all of this here is D's graph, which was not detached whenever we created F. So we can access it here whenever we are plotting F's graph now. So here we can see that tensor D was a result of the addition operation that occurred on leaf tensors A and B. So by inspecting these two graphs, we can see how they illustrate what actually happens when we detach a graph from its tensor. Now that we have an understanding of computational graphs 
and what it means to detach a tensor from a graph, we can now understand what we were doing in our earlier project when we were detaching the tensor from its computational graph when we were training DCGAN and PyTorch. Check out the corresponding blog for this episode to understand why we're doing that detaching during the training process. But by now, we should have an understanding of what detaching is and what computational graphs are in general and how they're used in neural network training. Hey, thanks so much for watching this episode. I hope that you enjoyed it. To see more content from us, check out our second channel called Deep Blizzard Vlog on YouTube. And be sure to check out the corresponding blog for this episode on deepblizzard.com for additional resources. And while you're at it, consider joining the Deep Blizzard Hive Mind, where you'll gain access to exclusive perks and rewards. Thanks for contributing to Collective Intelligence. I'll see you next time.